CBDCs are the biggest threat to, to civil liberty. There will be severe limitations on how you could spend the cash in your wallet. It's almost a miracle that was created by Satoshi Nakamoto. 99% of all euros existing are digital today. The ECB really steams ahead, wants to implement that, wants to implement it fast. Do you really want government to know how much alcohol you buy, how many cigarettes, how many speeding tickets you get, which political party you donate to, which religious group you donate money to, whether you have an illegitimate child, you need to support. CBDCs are fiat currencies on steroids. Today, I want to really focus on, on CBDCs more than, than Bitcoin, maybe lay down a little bit about Bitcoin also. Um, but I think most people are not aware how bad CBDCs actually are. Um, but first, let's start with like, what are CBDCs and why are you so passionate about it? So what are CBDCs? CBDCs um, is a, a new form of money that central banks want, want to issue. And um, there, the debate already starts. Is it really a new type of money? Because it's essentially an account that you hold with a central bank and you will hold money with the central bank. And this money will be digitally transferred then uh, between you and other participants in the economy. So the, the thing that changes is that you don't have the, the network of banks and you directly have a bank account with the ECP if you're in Europe or Federal Reserve if you're in America. Exactly. So you would hold your money with the ECB in the Eurozone with the, with the Federal Reserve in the US. Correct. What are the implications of that? Like, what what, what is uh, then happening? So um, you need to look at it at two stages. Now, the first stage will be um, that this is an additional type of money that will be issued. But in the second stage, and there's no doubt about it, it will replace the current cash that we know. So um, you will no longer hold your euro bills, euro notes in your wallet and no longer the, the, the dollar bills, but you will have credit with central banks. Interesting. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's fascinating for me because then they have way more possibilities to directly manipulate the, the supply, have more control over that. Um, is it then also CBDCs for you, then they are also programmable. So they are like, oh, if, if you are having a phone and you're in that region, you can only spend that much. Like, is, is that thing actually happening where you see like they have spending limits and all those things? So, so when you think of it, um, you have no longer your, your notes in your wallet, um, but you want to transact with someone. So uh, you want to give a note to someone else, um, to a vendor down the street or to your friend you can no longer do so directly, but you need to go via a middleman and the middleman is called central bank. And the central bank um, can censor this piece of transaction. Um, I would argue even at will, but there will be legislation. Um, but the techno technology will provide possibilities for all what you said. So programmability of the money, um, and also in terms of um, time, when you can spend it, um, a best before date, but also uh, geofencing the usage of money. So yes, um, there will be severe limit limitations on how you could spend the cash in your wallet. That's, uh, <laughs> that's frightening in itself. Um, what, what, it, what, what do you say is like the current state of, of the CBDCs? I, I know about Nigeria, they, they tried something, but it kind of failed. Uh, with the Inara or, or what it was called. Um, do you know like what, what was already tried in the past? Maybe let's start with that and then we can move on what, what's currently happening. Yes, yeah, so, so now you have um, two examples basically, the Inara and the Sand Dollar in the Bahamas. And the, the uptake of those two is not, not very well, um, quite the opposite. In, in, in Nigeria, the, even riots broke up broke off over the introduction of the Inara, where you have an example where things are going rather smooth is, of course, um, the digital yuan in China, which has been rolled out in, in several provinces and um, working rather smoothly there. Do you think that, that actually, 
for, for me, it's really hard to imagine because uh, when, when someone says like, oh, you have that money that already is bad because there's like debasement going on as, as we, we know with fiat. But then, oh yeah, there's also a spending limit. Oh, there's also that and that catch. Like and digital, like digital already is our money. Like the, the actual bills that we transact is already a very small part of the all transactions. I personally like I try to use cash, but it's like <laughs> it's not that easy anymore, uh, and it's so convenient also with with Apple Pay and with all those things. Um, why would someone choose something that has no advantages and and just brings more more limitations to your money? In, in very simple terms, you'll be forced to. In very simple terms, but you are absolutely right. Um, looking at the Eurozone, for instance, 99% of all euros existing are digital today. So when the claim is made, oh, we need to have digital money, it's utterly ridiculous because we already have digital money. We have it for many years and 99% of the money existing in, Euro, in the Eurozone is digital. Why will people use it? Well, the legislation that will be put in place, that there's already um, some, some proposals out there, um, are that the digital euro will be issued as a mandatory legal tender. And now the, the word mandatory is very important here. So far, the euro is legal tender in the eurozone. But if you as a vendor put out a sign, no euro accept, accepted, I only accept apples, you can do so. It's your right, contractual freedom. However, with the digital euro being implemented as mandatory legal tender, you will no longer be able to put such a sign out. You as a vendor, you will be forced to accept it. And how it will then trickle down in the economy that we can also talk about, but you will be forced to use that money. I mean, that's, uh, that's, so like right now as a store owner in the Eurozone, you can basically only accept Bitcoin, only accept whatever you want to accept. And you don't even have to accept Euro. This was, uh, this is new for me, actually. This is again, this is something that is happening. The, the proposal is out. Um, many people are not aware of this term mandatory legal tender is new not known to many. It also has some implications as, for instance, when you go to, to a McDonald's in the Eurozone, you very often see the signs, um, no 100 or 200 note accepted here. Or you go to a gas station, it says, I had that recently in, in Germany, no 200 euro note accepted here. So companies, sellers reserve the right to not accept legal tender. And they can do so with cash. They just need to make you aware prior to concluding the deal. With a digital euro, they have to accept the, the digital euro. Well, let's go into this, what you just uh, teased. Uh, how will this then trickle down in the economy uh, and be basically then used by everyone? So um, now, if you imagine it becomes mandatory legal tender, um, it will be very easy for governments to say, okay, we have a legal tender, we have a mandatory legal tender. We also pay our, whatever we pay, transfer payments in legal tender. And more specifically, in mandatory legal tender. So if you think, for instance, about Germany with, it, with, with its, its budget of, of 1 trillion euros, one third of that is social payments. So government, the German government, could then easily say, hey, you know what? We no longer make you money transfers to your bank account, but we'll transfer you the money in digital euros. And as it's mandatory legal tender, well, you have to accept it. There's no way around it. And then, then you have all of a sudden a huge chunk of GDP being circulated, being paid in digital euros how close is that like how how close uh, are, are we talking is that coming in like one two years or like 10 years uh, well th th there's a good news and the bad news here the the bad news is that the ecb um really um steams ahead wants to implement that wants to implement it fast the good news is we know how bad public institutions are with large scale it projects so um you know, when they say 
we want to implement it within two years. I think that's currently the, the plan. We can be pretty sure it, it will not happen within two years. That's true. Uh, they, uh, they, they have a long history of implementing things. Um, <laughs> I, I just think about the Berlin uh, airport. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's, that's that's a good example. You know, all the all the the toll projects for German roads. Um, so within two years or three years, what the what the ECB is planning, I I don't think that's realistic. How will how will is there already a plan how this technically will be implemented? Are they doing their own blockchain? Are they doing their own project? Are they using some uh, existing infrastructure? Um, no, there's, there's no, there are no details out yet how this will be technically implemented, but also um, that means not having details out yet means also we don't, we were never told it will be a permissionless public blockchain or, or um, a network of those. No, it, it, most likely it won't be. Otherwise, that they would have already announced. So we can be pretty sure it will be a a permissioned private blockchain, if at all. I mean, I don't actually even see the need to use a blockchain for that purpose. If it's centralized, there's no need for a blockchain. Like, uh, honestly, like uh, blockchain is such an inefficient way to store data, uh, except it's decentralized and you want to have like uh, immutability and all, all those things. But I, I, I see no, no use case as a blockchain for an e e digital me, euro. Me neither, not at all. So it's, it's better to just store it in a, a conventional uh, database. Can we still, do, do you see a hope uh, in the future that we still block this completely or is it more like we should soften the, the blow? So um, can, we, can we block it? Um, I, think, I think the US has delivered an example um, that um, it can be at least put on, it can be put on hold. Um, the, the Congress has, has voted against CBDCs in the US, um, which, which I find remarkable and which is actually a role model for all those in Europe who say, well, we have to accept it. No, not really. Um, you know, maybe contact your representative in parliament and, and tell them I don't want it. It's, I also heard that like America is the great example. Then we have China on the other hand, uh, that is a, a bad example. But then there's also Canada, which I heard they doing also something with social security and binding it to the, the money. Uh, and I heard this by, like a small note, like a few months back. I don't know if they actually do it. Um, but is it, It's like we have the Federal Reserve, we have America now, we have China and we have Europe. Is there something else going on? Maybe Canada, Australia, do you know about uh, projects outside of those regions? Um, so basically there's, there's, um, there's research going on in, in very many countries. I mean, this, I think above 90% of all central banks pursue now uh, um, digital currency projects. Um, some do just on wholesale level, some, some go further down on retail level. Um, there are some um, banks that, that, that are further ahead than others. Um, I don't know any specifically about the, the Canadian Central Bank, for instance, um, but I know that there is a, a pretty positive stance currently of the Canadian Central Bank towards CBDCs, um, but it remains to be seen. It remains to be seen. I think it also will depend a lot um, on the political landscape. So in Canada, for instance, the, the um, head of the, the opposition party has a strong stance against CBDC. So I think it, it could change with the next election. Or yeah, Let, let's see. I think they have, I think next year is the election in Canada, if I'm confirmed, informed correctly, but it's, it's, it's not that uh, wide out. Um, maybe let's, let's paint a little bit of a picture um, because yeah, it's digital. Oh yeah, it's it's a little bit differently. Um, but what what will um, if if we now think of there's no Bitcoin, there's no cash, there's no alternative payment system, alternative uh, asset in in that regard. Everything is kind of fiat denominated, and we have that fiat CBDC, digital euro, uh, digital Federal Reserve notes uh, as a future. Um, What will that world look like? What, what, what's what's possible, uh, and and what, what can, can you paint us a picture of that world? 
So, so um, painting your picture of a world um, with, without Bitcoin, so Bitcoin being banned, and basically what is left are CBDCs. So, yeah. so uh, 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 yes, I, I can paint you the picture of a world with only CBDCs. Um, it will be a world where alternative means of payment spring up. And uh, why I say that is pretty simple, because we had that already in history. So we had the entire Eastern Bloc, where you had currencies that were worthless, but officially used. So you would get your salary in those currencies, Polish Zloty, um, East German Mark, and so on. Um, you would get your official salaries, you pay your rent, you pay your um, food with it. All those prices were not market prices, but fantasy prices made up by government. And otherwise, you could use the money for nothing. So the official money was essentially worthless. And then you had alternative monies for which you could get anything at any time. So those were then the Western currencies. So with the US dollar, um, you could essentially get in Poland whatever you wanted at any time. So there will be a world of official currencies, CBDCs, and inofficial currencies. And there we still need to see what it is. It could, for instance, be precious metals. Just, just an idea. It could also be um, other digital currencies, private currencies, which are virtually impossible to ban, such as Bitcoin. But it remains to be seen. It will be a world, however, of official currencies that are worthless, that can buy you nothing. You know, go to a shop, find empty shelves. There you can buy um, goods with the official currency and you'll find black markets where you can get anything anytime with inofficial money. Oh, man. So when we speed up that process and thought a little bit more, do you think that a CBDC, because it's even worse than the money that we have right now, could actually then speed up the adoption of the alternative assets like gold, Bitcoin and so on? Absolutely. So um, the CBDC, CBDCs will be worse than our current money. Um, CBDCs are fiat money on steroids, you know, um, because you don't even need paper or cotton or and ink to produce them. You simply mint by pressing a button. So um, you can you can increase uh, you can increase the the money flow at will, um, and thus it will be worse than our current um, money, and it will spur other monies to become more um, prominent, absolutely. So yes, I, I see, in that sense, I see it as a catalyst for other monies, alternative mm. assets, yes. That's really interesting. Um, when we look now at an individual level, how should we, like, first of all, like your thing is like, let's call your local politicians, let's say like, oh, we, we don't want CBDCs, please don't vote for CBDCs, uh, local politicians. That's like something everyone can do uh, to try to soften it or block it or whatever, so that maybe we come to a state where the EU is doing something similar than uh, America is doing right now. Uh, but on another note, how can we protect each other from... So, um, how can we... Um, how? Can we postpone it, first of all, I mean, by, for instance, by using cash, uh, etc. Um, when it then happens, again, the, I think the best strategies are to be, to be in real assets, as, as CBDCs are fiat currencies on steroids. Um, your real asset will not be inflated away. So be in real assets. And another um, way of, of protecting yourself from CBDCs, some people claim, is shielding your privacy, because that's another topic we haven't talked about in detail yet, but shielding your privacy by the means of a, a, a legal entity that you put around you. So um, basically using corporation shell as the one that holds CBDCs and spends CBDCs 
um, so that at least government can't, can't intrude on your privacy. Yeah, that's a whole nother topic with CBDCs, rather right? than privacy. It's it's like then they have a complete database of everyone, whatever they spend, and they can request that at like at any point, and it's centralized in one uh, thing. It's also interesting when you take like it's a big honeypot, like it's uh, data from everyone in the world uh, in like. Oh, everyone in this jurisdiction uh, of what they spend. And we know that no system really is safe from hackers, <laughs> especially not uh, things that are made by the government. Um, what does this mean like for like cyber attacks, for privacy on CBDCs, for the individual? So um, what it means is central banks uh, will essentially create a, a data trove of every transaction a human makes from the first pacifier um, you know you get as a baby to basically uh, the coffin you buy at the end of your life so basically a full record of every transaction for a human being and um, there are many people who say okay um, I'm I'm a good citizen I don't commit any crimes and I have nothing to fear government should know everything I, I buy Those people I would like to remind, do you really want to know how much alcohol, do you really want government to know how much alcohol you buy, how many cigarettes, um, how many speeding tickets you get, um, which political party you, you spend, uh, you donate to, um, which religious group you donate money to, um, um, whether you have an illegitimate child, you need to support, and so on and so forth. So you can be a perfectly good citizen and still want to make transaction that government doesn't know. Whether you go to a psychiatrist, for instance, or a psychologist, you know, all these things, which lawyers you pay, you may not want government to know. And it's your right that government doesn't know, but it will be in this big data set that government can collect on you and and that's that's the big privacy issue that we have with if you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis i guess you already bought some bitcoin and now the most important step is to keep the bitcoin keep them secure in a hardware wallet my personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the bitbox it's super secure it's simple to set up it's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the bitcoin on an exchange and you can get a five percent discount with the code Robin at the checkout. Visit bitbox.swiss slash Robin to get your bitbox. And if you really want to bulletproof your self-custody setup, your security setup, and maybe even your citizenship set up, you have to talk to the Bitcoin way. If you go to the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash Robin, you get a 30-minute free call where you can dive deep with them if your self-custody setup is secure, if your citizenship is secure or maybe might be improvable, or your digital footprint in general is secure. They are the experts in cybersecurity, in Bitcoin self-custody, and how to be a secure, sovereign individual in general. And for those of you who are in search of a new Bitcoin exchange where they can buy their Bitcoin from, I recommend my personal Bitcoin exchange 21 Bitcoin. With code Robin, you get a hefty discount for all your purchases in the future. And I always hear uh, those people saying, oh no, but I don't do anything wrong. And I'm like, oh, but maybe uh, there will one day come a government that in their eyes, you're doing something wrong, even though ethically you're not doing something wrong. So like, uh, that's, that's interesting for me. Yeah. So, so, I mean, you raise a very good point there. Um, that is, that is a very um, important principle in, in, in philosophy. When you consider um, uh, decisions, you know, it's called the veil of ignorance. You don't know what is behind the veil and therefore you should consider um positive and negative outcomes. Now, you may think today, what I do today is perfectly legitimate. Tomorrow, there may be a different government in place that revalues your decisions today. So could be that uh, you donate to a party today and think it's perfectly legitimate today, comes a new government in tomorrow, 
and you may not be um, qualified for certain jobs with government anymore. You maybe you get kicked out as a civil servant because 10 years ago you donated to the wrong party. So when you think, hey, it's okay today, also consider what could happen tomorrow, what could happen under totally different circumstances, you know, under the worst possible government, so to say. Yeah, and it's, that's, what, that, that's the point I always try to make out with CBDCs. It's like we are installing a tool which is highly dangerous and is controlling and monitoring all financial transactions. And even if we assume everyone uh, it has their best intentions at heart and is a great human being involved in those projects, what if there's one day in like 30 years, someone coming that doesn't do does that. Like it's just like a, a centralized tool uh, which is really um, uh, powerful that can be um, that can be misused by someone. It's just a matter of time till the first till a person comes that misuses it. In, in, in let's say like that. You, you pretty much nailed it. Yes. So it is a tool, and even if the people today have have the best intentions at heart. It could be abused in the future in, in most terrible ways. So in, in such terrible ways that my claim is CBDCs are the biggest threat to, to civil liberties that we face in our lifetime and potentially in future lifetimes. So think also what you want to leave behind to your children, grandchildren, whatsoever. Should, should we move... Uh... Or like, when should we move out of the EU uh, and go to uh, another place where there are no CBDCs? Maybe America goes down the road where there are absolutely no CBDCs. Maybe even Donald Trump announces some strategic reserve and the Bitcoin Prague in like one day or something like that. Uh, is, is there a point where you would say like, oh, now I actually have to move out? That's, that's a very good question. Maybe you're asking the wrong person because I, I live in Switzerland and, and Switzerland has no intention of introducing <laughs> retail. CBDCs. So um, for now, I feel pretty safe here, you know. And and um, I, I recently spoke to a former um, member of the Swiss Parliament, and he said to me, you know, if if they were to introduce retail CBDCs in Switzerland, we would have riots. We would have a civil war on our hands. So this is why I believe in Switzerland we are fairly safe from CBDCs, from retail CBDCs, let's put it that way. It's, it, for me, it's interesting because I'm from Austria and for me, it's like Switzerland is like Austria plus there's no EU. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's, that's where, why we have the plus on our passports. <laughs> <laughs> interesting. Uh, but w w would you recommend so to someone that lives in the EU, like me, uh, to move just a few kilometers uh, to the uh, yeah to the west uh, to Switzerland? Um, it depends on 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 the person I'm talking to. So I mean, there there will be enough people who don't care. There will be also enough people um, who don't um, who are not affected by it. You know, maybe they don't don't change their lifestyle at all under a CBDC regime. And maybe they also um, don't mind if government have all, all their transactional data. Um, however, um, if, if I talk to people like you, I guess I would recommend yes. If retail CBDCs are introduced um, as, as the sole means of payment, of, of legal tender, of a state, of a country, I would move out. I guess that, that would be then the last, uh, the, the, that would be the straw that, that breaks the camel's back, basically, yes. Are you also, um, are you originally from, from Germany, if I'm allowed to ask? Uh, so yes, originally I was, I was born in Germany. I, I moved to Switzerland about 20 years ago, yes. Why was that the decision? Is it was just professionally or was it there also intentionally outside of you? No, that was for love. I met my, my wife and uh, we moved together. Oh, that's that's the best reason to move, I guess. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, now let's come to, to the Bitcoin topics. I'm really curious also what, uh, as someone who's really opposed to CBDCs, uh, what's your thoughts on, on Bitcoin? Um, so... My thought on Bitcoin is that it's uh, 
it's a first of all a, a brilliant technological uh, feat that we have here. I mean, you see the I have a, a model of a of a blockchain on my shelf uh, that that I use. Uh, I built it from Lego of my children that I use to explain the blockchain to my students, and um, I think. Technologically, it's almost a miracle that was created by uh, Satoshi Nakamoto. Um, and its social implications are, are also vast. I mean, um, we have the Austrian School of Economics, um, uh, most notably Hayek, who in the 70s published a book about the denationalization of money. And we see that becoming reality with Bitcoin. So from a technological, also sociological um, point of view. I think it, it's an absolute outstanding uh, invention there that we have. Is there a chance that we live in maybe 20, 30 years on a, on a Bitcoin standard without those? CB I think there is, there is a, a chance that is bigger zero. Yes, I, I think that um, there is a chance. I still advocate um, a competition among monies, you know? like like Hayek did. So um, if there are different um, monies out there, um, privately issued and governmental issued, they com should compete for quality and then have people decide which, which money they want to transact in. And therefore, I think uh, Bitcoin would be in a, in a good position. Of course, they, we need to see the technological upgrades and so on, make it quantum proof and so on but yes they, why not it's also interesting uh, because it goes in the similar direction what um Xavier Millet is saying in Argentina he just wants to have a free competition of all currencies in Argentina and wants to demolish the, the central banks I did not follow up what he actually did uh, in the last few uh, couple of months since he's elected um is is the 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 thing that Javier Millet in Argentina is doing, kind of the, the the best way to go ahead and see, like, oh, let's let's just enable free competition in our country. Um, so I, I think the the empirics they they prove that he is is pretty right on his course. What he's doing, um, he got, to my knowledge, he got Argentina out of out of recession. Um, that's astounding, um, and. The, the, well, the, the currency issue, I think he um, he still needs to fix in the long run. You know, he still needs to fix that that issue and see which currency would be best suited. But um, taking his taking his free will, um, I could imagine that he will have um, different currencies circulating in Argentina. Really cool. What's your thoughts on, on El Salvador? I mean, they were not not as with Argentina. They really tried to get Bitcoin in the country. Like the, 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 the president is, is buying Bitcoin. He's advocating for Bitcoin. He's really trying also to get Bitcoiners and Bitcoin companies in the in the country, which is an interesting move. Uh, so he's, he's less like, oh, free uh, market. Let's have all the currencies competing. He's more like, oh, I think Bitcoin is the best thing and let's let's have Bitcoin in the country. What what is what's that move? So um, to be honest, I I don't know how um, how successful that will be in in the long run. However, um, what I totally um, admire is that that he took this bold move, and we need people um, trying out alternative ways. So I think we know that fiat currencies in the long run don't work. It's, it's just a matter of fact. Having people who try alternative paths um, that can serve as role model for others in other countries, that's fantastic. That is, uh, that is very, very brave to do. And um, in his case, I'm, I'm thankful that we have basically this example that we can in the long run compare to other countries. Fantastic, fantastic that he did so. It's really cool to, to see El Salvador because it's like in, in 10 years time, we like right now, I think 
it's such a bold move that we can not even really measure if it was successful. Yes, we know murder rate is down, but that's not because of Bitcoin. We know tourism is up because, yeah, a lot of people are curious now about El Salvador, way more people speaking about it. Uh, but if it's actually successful, I guess we, we at least have to wait another eight to 10 years to really um, judge that uh, if, if it was like that. It would be interesting because I also made a lot of interviews already with people that moved back to El Salvador because of Ney Bukele or are now moving to El Salvador because of him. Uh, it will be really interesting to go back to those interviews and see in 10 years how, how this actually developed and how it actually uh, turns out. I myself probably will visit in November. I was never there. I, I really want to see how far the Bitcoin adoption is going, how how seamless uh, everything is is doing. Uh, I'm a big fan of like actually <laughs> trying the thing on the ground and, and seeing how it goes. You were never in El Salvador. So, uh, unfortunately, I haven't I haven't visited it. Uh, I, I also I would like to go there. Um, I don't know when I'll be able to. Um, what is what is so important also just from a scientific point of view is to have basically this this comparison case. This comparison case. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a comparison group. You know, that would be fantastic. We would have several countries um, doing this alternative way and then having another 200 who go the fiat way. But to see then, to compare it in detail, what works and doesn't work. And I'm thankful that this case study exists. Yeah, and so early, it was definitely a surprise for me that uh, so early in the Bitcoin history, we have this, especially when we look at the history of money, it usually takes a long time. Um, I got yesterday uh, a comment, and I get this comment, I think once a month at least, uh, and the profile picture was like, end the Fed, uh, so end the central bank in, in America. And the comment was interesting because I guess he gets the problem, uh, but he does not want to see Bitcoin as a solution. And the comment was basically, uh, CBDCs are just training wheels from the government to introduce CBDCs after that. So like Bitcoin is like an, an, an precursor to CBDCs from the government to try them out. I hear that uh, unfortunately all the time. And it's, of course, those things occur in the internet. But why do you, is, is, do you think there's anything to it, first of all? And, and uh, do you think, and why do you think the, that, that, that thinking is in, in, in our heads? Um. So, so um, in other words, what you're saying is Bitcoin, according to the, those comments, is a big false fl flag operation by government to herd us into CBDCs. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, well, I, that, that would require such an amount of um, three-dimensional chess playing, you know, that over years and years. And so, so that I doubt that it, there's any truth to it. I mean, also, if you see, if you look at the hit history of Bitcoin, Bitcoin, it was not clear that Bitcoin um, would would become the big success that is today. I mean, I remember back in, in the days when, when Bitcoin was new, there were these Bitcoin faucets all over the internet where you, where you need to do a capture and you would get Bitcoins for free. That was that was just uh, how to how to spread the usage of bitcoin and um and if that would all be government driven it wouldn't have been on the brink it would there there would the, the government would have uh, banged the drums for it and so on now this and that over several changes in politics and governments and so on no this i I Perfect. Yeah, I just wanted to address this because it's a, it's something that comes up since like one year, like every month there's a comment like that. And uh, I always respond to that, but I, I wanted to get it once <laughs> on the video and I felt like you were the perfect guest to talk about that uh, because you are not that... Usually I have really, uh, let's say, laser-eyed Bitcoin maxis on my show. <laughs> let's, say, let's, let's call it like that as, as myself. Uh, and, and so I wanted to get it with you because you're a little bit different than that. You have a little bit more of a scientific um, uh, approach to Bitcoin. And I like that a lot. And I try to also break out every once in a while a little bit of the bubble. I also have people on that just have like a small allocation to Bitcoin and have everything else in gold or gold-related uh, uh, investments. 
uh, because I think we can uh, really benefit from a, a broader perspective. The only thing that I will not have on is, is shit corners, <laughs> that I call them like that. Um, but coming to the end routine, before the end routine, there's always one question that I always ask my guests. Um, I always usually ask, what can we can learn from you besides Bitcoin? But today I will ask you, what can we learn from you besides CBDCs and Bitcoin? Besides CBDCs and Bitcoin? Um, well, what you can learn from me is that there, there is still a fantastic world out there with, with many opportunities. And I my field of interest is fintech. Um, and there are tremendous opportunities out there you can pursue. And also with that, trying to, to make society a bit better step by step. So the entire topic of decentralized finance I find it fantastic. Um, you can learn about that from me and maybe also work together with me to make it happen and make society uh, better by actually making the entire financial system more democratic. Maybe uh, one question to, to squeeze in here. Uh, how impactful is money in our society? How, how, how different is a society when the money is different as the base layer so if if the money is is totally different as the base layer society is also totally different there there is this um soviet um proverb saying they they make us believe that they pay us and we will make them believe that we work for them so in other words if i receive for my work money that is worthless I will also not work. And that will lead then to, to empty shops, empty shelves. That will lead to, uh, to people refusing to work, essentially. And um, society will be entirely different. Yeah. And I can, we, we have so many examples already in history that, that prove and show us that. And it's, it's really cool to see. Um, yeah. End, yeah. 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 And, and also, what, what I find fascinating at the current moment, and going back to CBDC, sorry, but is that we are running into these massive problems because of uh, central banking, because of too much central banking, because of too much power in a few hands. And now we want to get rid of those problems by concentrating even more power in even fewer hands. And this is not going to work. This is not going to work. Is central banking, if done right, or could central banking be done right in a good way where money actually works or will central banking always lead to uh, more and more inflation, more and more control in small and smaller hands because you always have to print more when something happens and stuff like that? So if you would have a, a central bank that is totally independent and if you have the, the prototype of good people governing a central bank, um, I think central, a central banking system could last very long. In the very long run, I even doubt that such a central banking system would be to the benefit of the people because it's a monopoly. It's, it's a monopoly and sooner or later the monopoly will misallocate money and, and free market forces could do that better. Okay, now I have, I have one more question coming up in my head now. <laughs> Sorry. Um, is, is, is money over the long run, there's this like concept of singularity in money that we uh, kind of end up with one form of money for society over a very long uh, time. Uh, I mean, history kind of does not prove that to a certain extent, but uh, there are a lot of interesting concepts of like, oh, in, in the long run, we will end up on, on one money uh, also this, uh, how is it called, the Kardashev scale, uh, where we move up the type one civilization, where we have one type of money that works for the whole planet. Um, do you think we, we, we get there where we kind of end up with, with one great money source, could be Bitcoin? Um, I, I sort of doubt it, to be honest, because I believe um, also um, just by the means of innovation, new types of money will come up, you know? So even if we, if we believe in Bitcoin and think Bitcoin is, is the greatest existing money currently, new monies will come up. So 
I, I don't think until the end of humanity, Bitcoin will be the one single money. Um, but if you look, if you look at um, Star Trek and, and so on, they, they depict the future basically without money because they will have um, endless energy sources. And um, if you have endless energy sources, cheap energy, then basically everyone can fulfill their dreams and no money is needed. That, that, that is the way of thinking. But um, I doubt that one single money um, will exist. That's an interesting end to the podcast. Perfect. Um, we have an end routine in the podcast where uh, the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually is. Always brings up uh, interesting questions, sometimes about Bitcoin, sometimes about life, sometimes about uh, uh, everything uh, about life. Um, and your question is an interesting one. Never was in the podcast before. What are your three most important values in life? Uh, three most important values in life. I think... My, my family is my most important value, and um, that, that, that comes first place. Um, friendship is, is the second, definitely. And the third is humility, I would say. You know, treat everyone else in, in a nice and fair way. Perfect. I love it a lot. Um, thank you, Patrick, for, for joining us today. Also, thank you for everyone uh, listening and watching uh, for joining us today. I'll be back as always tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye. Cool. Thank you very much. Bye.